Excellent. So my presentation today is, uh, if you own a multifunction printer, then I own you, or potentially own you. Uh, obviously not all of them are bad and not all of them are being used in an unvulnerable fashion, but in today's presentation we're going to be discussing uh, multifunction printers and uh, hacking multifunction printers and stealing data off multifunction printers. Uh, corporate and home office type style systems. Uh, I'm from the Dayton, Ohio region. Uh, I come up here or come down here every year with uh, a bunch of my friends. I've been in IT for 18 years. Uh, I've been in uh, security for eight plus years and uh, three of those years I've been working as a security pen tester, assessment engineer, that type of stuff. Um, I'm a member of the FUFAS net team. Uh, if you're familiar with that, uh, that's the group that puts out uh, the Medusa and FG dump tools. Uh, and this is my fourth year presenting at uh, CarolinaCon. It's just actually killer. I enjoy coming here every year. So um, no one's ever hit me with a beer bottle yet, so hopefully we'll make it through this one too. Hopefully they can run fast if they miss. <laughs> so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, in today's agenda, we're going to be talking about uh, multifunction printers and their functions and features uh, and, and what those functions and features mean. We're going to talk about attacking multifunction printer devices, uh, the why, when, how, uh, and leveraging the data that we gather off these devices. Uh, of course, we're going to have a few demos. I don't think anyone ever, has ever seen me do a presentation without demos. Those are always fun. So we got a couple, two or three simple demos to uh, make the point here. Oh, geez. <laughs> Good thing I got sunglasses on. And then we're going to talk about the, the tool that we released earlier this year called Preetta. So let's go ahead and get started on uh, multifunction printers, functions, and features. <clears throat> so wh what is our ultimate goal? Our goal is to be able to leverage data off these printers that can be used to carry out attacks against other corporate systems. And the type of features that we're, we're looking for on printers are, are an example or like email, um, the service settings, the address books that contain usernames that may contain passwords. Uh, we're going to show examples of those. Uh, faxing services that contains contact information, usernames. Again, usernames are, are half of the puzzle in a brute force attack, so they're of value to an attacker. Uh, and that information can be pulled from address books. Uh, we're also talking about the scanning functionality. A lot of these multifunction printers, you can walk up to them, and they have what's known as scan the file functions. That means you can put a sheet of paper or whatever you want to scan on there, hit scan, and it'll actually store it somewhere. It'll store it on a, a Microsoft file server, it'll store it on an FTP uh, service server somewhere. Uh, so we're looking at those settings, uh, system settings, user settings. Also, a lot of these devices interact with LDAP, uh, the ability to walk up to some of these large-scale printers and authenticate yourself to that device. Well, how is it able to do that? It integrates within the corporate's LDAP server uh, in some fashion, and the only way it can do that is it has to have uh, some way to connect to it. It actually has a username or a password to authenticate itself potentially to an LDAP server. So we're looking for those type of features and functions. Uh, logging is always a wealth of information. There's a lot of devices out there, specifically collar printers, that log enough detailed information you can do chargeback functions. So it'll actually log the user's uh, network username into the logging system every time he does a print job. And of course, uh, the, the remote retrieval of uh, print, scan, or fax jobs off these devices could also uh, be of some value. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to start looking at some of these features on uh, some of the more large-scale multifunction devices out there. In this case, we're talking about the Toshiba eStudio. So uh, this is underneath the administrator screen. If we blow that up, we look at some of the setting functions that are here. Uh, examples, the network settings, email settings, which may contain information for SMTP to be able to authenticate to an SMTP server. Save as file, which was this uh, data back here, uh, which is a scan the file function, which contains information that could potentially be used to log on to a server to store the data. Um, internet faxing, haven't dug into that one, that sounds interesting. Um, and various other functions and features that exist on this device. The next one, uh, real quick on this, this is Canon Image Runner. We blow up uh, these services over here and we can see the additional functions that we have on these devices. Um, register uh, your LDAP service as I mentioned, so this contains uh, username and authentication information stored on the printer to connect to the LDAP service. 
uh, other cool settings over here, if we go further down to the import export, this is the ability to do a full backup of various stuff off the printer. It may be the configurations of the printer. It may actually be address books and various things like that. So we're actually going to show how uh, this export data can be used to retrieve a lot of this core information that may be of value to attack a system. Uh, the Xerox uh, uh, WorkCentra Pro, there's millions of these out there. I'm seeing more advanced models coming up every day. Uh, and here we also have, uh, as we explode up this screen, various settings under protocols. We obviously have SNMP. Uh, you know, if a company actually configures, as an example, an SNMP to be no other than public or private because they want to manage it in some fashion, what's the chance of that new uh, community string being used on other systems within the organization? So that's data that could potentially be used to attack with. Uh, also, uh, SMTP services, it's highlighted down there. That would obviously be a connection into the email system. Uh, and it may contain authentication information so that uh, faxes can be sent out through email or receive emails for faxes and stuff like that. Uh, we go on to another screen within the Xerox and we come down to the cloning function. And this is a really fascinating function. The cloning function is the ability for the printer, uh, let's say you have 50 Xerox printers you need to deploy with you throughout your corporation. Do you really want to log into each one of these and configure them? Well, you don't have to. You can actually do the cloning function, uh, make a snapshot of a configured printer, and deploy that out to as many systems as you need to over the, over the wire through the printer functions. So I think this is the last one we're going to touch base on from a configuration standpoint is a RICO. Again, this is very similar to the other printers that we've looked at, same type of functions and features. It has logging, email, connectivity to the SMTPs underneath there, file transfer, the ability to authenticate transfer files to systems, um, and we also have LDAP services as an, ex as an example. These devices authenticate to uh, an LDAP server. Pretty much all the same type of functions and features. Now they're implemented and secured in various different fashions on each printer. But our ultimate goal is to rob, steal, cheat, and plunder these things as much as we possibly can. So let's go ahead and get into that, uh, attacking multifunction printers. So why do we want to attack multifunction printers? And I've said it a bunch of times already, gather information. We want to escalate our rights into other core systems within a corporation. One of the easiest paths to do this, and the one that's most likely to be ignored, is through the web interface on multifunction printers. So when are we going to do this? Uh, if you expose them to the internet and you say, why in the hell would anyone expose a printer to the internet? Obviously, you haven't Googled the internet for printers. <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is horrifying the number of printers that are out there. And it's even more horrifying the number of printers out there with default passwords still set on them. Um, as an assessment engineer, I don't normally find these printers set up uh, exposed to the internet. It's more of what I see um, during assessments. If I do a college or university, they have this open thing about them. They like to make everything free and open to everybody. In those cases, I've seen uh, multifunction printers exposed to the internet. Um, the other thing is, is uh, you know, or once you gain foothold into an organization, as a primary example of this, it was only like uh, two weeks ago during an assessment from the internet, I was able to uh, get a pa username and password and authenticate to an SSL VPN for the company. Well, that was the very limited access. All I got was their extranet web page that told things about the company uh, and what employees needed. But it turns out it was a, a Juniper using a pass-through portal that hadn't configured right. So basically, all I had to do was pass internal IP addresses to this portal, and it would attempt to connect over 80 or 443 or 8080 or whatever that web service was. So uh, using information gathered from another web server, I identified the internal IP addresses, put together a script, uh, and started playing it against their Juniper. And it basically started looking for web interfaces on the internal network. And I soon found their entire printer subnet. Uh, was able to crawl through about 30 different printers and retrieve uh, vital information that actually helped uh, escalate more access into their core systems. So that's a foothold approach. You get a single foothold, it's limited, but if I can read printers or access the printers, game over in some cases. Um, and the other thing is, you know, you're just sitting at work one day and you're bored as hell and you just want to screw somebody over. 
Uh, you know, those are the type of people that may go after these things and look at the printers. Unfortunately, or fortunately, a lot of times they've been ignored up to this point right here. Uh, and I have been generating all kinds of noise about multifunction printers. I mean, we're all, we're all so familiar with this, this thing it has been, you've been hearing it over and over, it's been on CNN, oh, printer hard drives, copier hard drives. Everyone's running around going, oh, dear God, we're losing all this information. And they still totally ignore this stuff here. But hopefully, I'm creating enough noise um, that that's going to change, and people are going to start paying more attention to their multifunction printers and their organizations, and we're going to get a better security out there, which is what the ultimate game is. It's not insecurity. It is security. So how are we going to attack multifunction printers? And we're going to discuss these here today. Uh, obviously, leveraging default passwords. We're all familiar with that. If, if you put a printer in place, you don't change the default password, you have access that way. Um, access bypass attacks. We're going to talk about that. Information leakage attacks. Once I gain access, where do I get this information from? Forceful browsing attacks. Very similar to access bypass attacks, but a little different. Uh, a passback attack. The, and we're going to talk about that. I won't go into much detail on that right now. And also backup and cloning functions. We're going to dig into those uh, with a couple demos uh, dealing with Xerox uh, cloning functions and their downloadable module creation process. So default passwords, uh, most, a, uh, most area of, of major fail. And we're all familiar with this. How many people in here uh, have all the passwords on their printers at work even set and changed so they're not the default? Uh, you know, that was about as many as I had to raise at Shmoo. Uh, so this prime example, you get a, you know, a very small percentage, and that's what I find during assessments. Uh, I find most of the time the printers have no password set, or it's a factory default password set on it. So now I do have access. Uh, where do we get the passwords? Uh, product manuals, always a good source. Uh, and here's some links down here. Uh, of course, we'll make these slides available. Uh, and these links can go to some password databases that are available on the internet, and you can pull passwords down. And at this point, I've, I think I've like memorized like half of the passwords for uh, most of the printers out there, but not all of them. That's my goal. OK, the next area we wanted to is talk about pass, uh, bypass attacks. Uh, the ability to bypass uh, the authentication of the device basically by twiddling with the URL, passing weird stuff to it. Uh, uh, various changes in a URL request to make the device go, oh, yeah, sure, here, you can have my content. Uh, we have two examples. Uh, one is a Toshiba, and the other one we're going to actually demo with the Office Jet. And on the Toshiba, if we look at this, this is the URL that you would pass to a Toshiba printer. And when you do this, it's going to redirect you over to the login, login.html or htm. And in this case here, the password would be uh, 123456 by default. But if that doesn't work, well, what do you do next? Well, it turns out that what I found out was purely by accident. So how many of us are real commonly will we'll cut and paste URLs, right? You cut and paste. And we're doing testing. We'll cut and paste, cut and paste. Well, I was doing a cut and paste. And I inadvertently left the extra slash in there uh, between top access and administrator. And believe it or not, it took me right into the system without any required authentication. So that's kind of an interesting one. Now the other one we got a demo here. Uh, and this is, a, this is an Office Scan, uh, Office Jet uh, HP device. And you see these. A lot of people buy these down at uh, Best Buy or whatever. But it turns out that I run into these in corporate America a lot. People love to put these in their office. They're inexpensive. Um, I don't know how much data you can get off these or how much integration they do. The various models have more and more integration. But uh, this particular model um, had some issues, and I want to show that to you, dealing with the bypass attack. So we bring up, we bring up the screen here. It's fairly straightforward. Uh, this is the home page. It redirects you to the, uh, the, the CAD info, print info. Uh, if we try to go to some of the settings, setting, in networking, if you try to go to those fields and there's a password set, it prompts you for the password. The truth is, I don't have a freaking clue what the password is. I changed it so long ago, I forgot. But uh, the stuff I'm going to show you today, you really don't need it. So, 
so you just hit cancel and I don't know if everyone can see that URL. I'll try to explode it up bigger. Um, but see, it goes to the unauthorized. So if we cut this out here, page equals fax address book one, and just paste it back in so that we have a page equals page equals fax address book one, it bypasses the security, gives us access. Uh, the funny thing about the whole thing is, is uh, between the first and second page equal, you can basically put anything you want, and it still works. Um, I'm not sure of why it's doing that, but you have to have at least two page equals to get this thing to work. Uh, so, so easily can bypass and get access to about 90% of the settings on this device. There's a few things you can't change without the password, and that is the actual password. But why the hell would you want to? There's no need for it. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to uh, the next section, and that is uh, information leakage attacks. So we've gained access, what next? Okay, well, the default password gives us access. Um, we've found methods to bypass the security on certain devices. Where do we take it from there? How do we gain access to this data that we're after? So the first one we're gonna look at is the Toshiba. So let's go ahead and explode this up. So we have this down at the bottom of the screen. It's real simple key pieces of information. If you see in the URL, there's two slashes in there, so I bypass the security to get to this particular page, which is a scan the file uh, configuration page. So we have in here, we have the server name and the server uh, folder structure. Here we have the Active Directory domain name and the actual username. And down here is that, that infamous blah, 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 that we all have gotten so accustomed to looking at. The thing is, though, has anyone really paid attention about what's sitting behind that? Especially when you're dealing with embedded systems. Actually, it's the password. So if you right-click on that field and would go, uh, you know, in Firefox, right-click properties, you're going to go right to this, and in plain text, the password existing. I have yet to find a modern multifunction printer that did not put it in plain text. A few years back, about, uh, about three or four years ago, I did find some that were actually base 64 encoding, but that's pretty much lame too. But they don't bother doing that anymore, it's just plain text. So then we move on to the actual image runner. Uh, this is fairly similar type thing. If we explode this up, I mean, we get the username, the password, and those nice little blocks again, and the domain name. This one's a little different. When you right click on this, go properties, it will take you to a whole bunch of black dots. But if you follow the data out to the end of the line, it made a Java call. You follow that Java call, and it takes you down to these hidden tags where we have the plain text password again being stored. Um, so never assume, kind of look at the code, follow it through to make sure that they have not obfuscated in some bizarre, stupid fashion. The one thing I missed to talk about, I think it's important. On this particular one right here, uh, the engagement I was on, this particular Toshiba printer was actually being used by the payroll department. So you want to guess what they were scanning in? Payroll documents. You want to know what the worst part was? They were nice enough to restrict this user. He could only get access to this folder right here. He could get access to anything within the domain that was everyone, because every time you create a user, he's a member of everyone. But they restricted he could only get access to that. But they were nice enough to actually store all of the full payroll system backups in that same folder for me. <laughs> so, I, so I basically quickly downloaded the five gig payroll system, extracted it out, and pulled down, uh, I think it was like 1,500, 2,500 employee credentials. And it was pretty much everything, their bank account information, uh, payroll deduction information, social security numbers, everything this person owned, and it was available, fully accessible because of a printer being used in the environment. So the next one we want to talk about is uh, forceful browsing. This is the ability to, if you know what the URL is, you can just enter it straight in and not follow the normal path of access. And we actually have a uh, in this example here, uh, I like to point out that it's common that the, the most common um, file types are usually properly secured. Things like .cgi, .htm, .html, from a security standpoint, 
uh, uh, typically are properly secured. So you try to get to those through forceful browsing. The security mechanism on the device will usually gab, grab that. But on devices that use other file names um, that don't fall in these normal uh, styles, it's not unusual to be able to just retrieve those through a forceful browsing and have it just give them to you. Uh, the other example is, is uh, it's very common to find some web pages uh, that are accessible uh, through links on a secure page. So you try to get to this page, it's secured, but if you had access, the links aren't secured. So if you know what the links are, you can go straight to them, bypassing their lame attempt at obfuscating in security. So we have two examples here. The first one is the uh, image runner, which is an unprotected file type. Uh, and the second one, we're going to do the office scan right here, uh, where we're talking about a forceful browsing by, we can't get to the secure page, but we know what the URLs are, and we can actually trigger some operation on this device by just injecting right into the URL. So the first one is uh, the image runners. And it turns out the image runners have, uh, by default, uh, 11 address books. Uh, once of, uh, and to get access to these address books from a forceful browsing attack, you have to have a valid cookie. So you can get a valid cookie by authenticating, but on some models, all you have to do is hit the home page first, and it will give you a valid cookie. And then you can do forceful browsing to the actual files, of the address book files. In this case, uh, if you look down at the bottom, we're looking at .ldif in, in this particular case. So I hit the home page, and then I can query the various address books straight up and have it give me that information. So here's one of the address books from an actual engagement. We pulled it down, and everyone goes, well, address books, what value are those? But the image runners typically contain other cool information. We explode this up. We can get the actual URL. We can actually get the username. And we can actually get a password. Now, this is kind of a scan to file function. The user comes up. His name's D. Smith. He authenticates the device. It validates him through LDAP. Now, if he does a scan to file function, it's actually going to store it in this location. And it's going to use these credentials to carry out that function. Uh, probably out of 20 or 30 companies that I've actually pulled this information from uh, their systems, I'd say probably about 20, 20%, 15 to 20% of the time, I actually find more than just usernames in at email addresses. I actually find some form of password being stored on those image runners. So then we get into uh, the, the HP Office scan. And this is an interesting forceful browser. Like I said, um, these devices are used in a lot of offices. Uh, the cool thing is, is you can like find about 50 or 60 of these on the internet. Uh, and several years ago, a reporter, I think it was, maybe it was last year, a reporter actually reported, uh, one of the internet reporters, uh, he had one of these and he found out that you can trigger the scan bed remotely on these devices. So if this device is on the internet and you expose it to the internet, anything you leave on the scan bed is potentially accessible. Um, and, he, and the first thing he said was, you need to secure these printers to protect that, or we're going to blow a hole in that for you. So if you have one of these things out there and you have it secured, uh, that isn't going to work. Just don't leave anything on the scan bed. So if we come over here to home, and we come down to the web application web scan, if we try to trigger web scan, it prompts us. Uh, in this case here, it doesn't have the page equal function. It's at the root of the URL. So they properly secured this page, at least up to this point. That doesn't mean there isn't some other screwy problem with it, but I haven't found it. So we get to this point right here. So I have some cut and paste because I'm lazy. So there's two operations. There was originally you had to make this query to the printer uh, off that page. Um, and it bring back a server status code. And once that status code come up, there was a post operation you had to do. But it turned out that you really don't need to do the post operation. You can just pass it as a standard get. Um, so if we go ahead and trigger this.
Now your Visa card's up there, man. <laughs> so, if you, so if you have one of these, uh, just remember that it's not secure. There's no way to properly secure that scan bed. Uh, I find these in a lot of corporate offices. And it's amazing the things you may find on these scan beds. Mostly it's not work related, it's usually personal related, uh, is really common. Someone, you know, it's uh, medical stuff they need to file or it's stuff they need to file at work or with their insurance company. That seems to be the common thing. I find a lot of insurance papers being stored on these things. Um, so uh, the tool we released, Preta, actually um, has the module built into it to automate doing this. So. Okay, the next attack we want to talk about is a pass-back attack. This is kind of a new approach. Um, this was uh, actually completely found about a month ago. One of the guys that was working uh, a security engagement said, hey, Daryl, I found a bunch of RICOs on the internal network I'm at. He set up a tunnel for me. I tunneled into that company and started playing with these printers. The whole idea of a pass-back attack is tricking the printer into passing data to me that he would expect to pass to some other service. In this case here, we're doing with the LDAP settings. So if you go into the RICO LDAP screens, and uh, you click on, in this case here, they have one called company directory. It's set up in the LDAP. Uh, but you can have up to five of these. So if we click on this, uh, it takes us over to various configurations. Uh, I think we can expand that up so everyone can see it. So here we have the server name, we have a search base, a typical LDAP port number, SSL's off, oh, come on. So if you're gonna use this, use SSL on. Uh, authentication on, username's LDAP admin, so it has, turns out it has a lot of rights to the LDAP server. And then we have a thing called password change, it's a button. So if we click on this, we get nothing. We have the ability to change the password that it uses to authenticate to the LDAP, but that's not what we want. The one thing we're after is at the bottom of the screen. It turns out they have a connection tester. So what it does is if I click this button, the RICO printer will go to the LDAP server and it'll authenticate to the LDAP server and basically give a response back saying, hey, this connection's good. So let's play with it. Let's go ahead and change the IP address on that configuration. Let's test the button. It comes back and connects to us we have a listener, and the password is printer187. So now we have full access to their LDAP server with LDAP admin uh, in their environment, tr easily by tricking. The cool thing about this is we're not finished uh, completely testing it. It turns out that, uh, let me come back here real quick. All the pieces of data here, except for the password, are actually sent in the post operation. So uh, the testing that I need to do, being an assessment engineer, you get limited access to these devices. So I'm waiting for another series of RICOs to get access to. I have a friend that works at a company that supposedly give these to me. I theorize that if we pass this data in the URL or in the post operation, that's the way we could do the, pa uh, the server's IP address. We don't necessarily have to change it on the printer. And that way, instead of making modifications to a device, triggering it, we just send it to the device in a post operation and it'll just make the correlation with the right uh, uh, password and send it back to us. That's some testing that's left to be done and I have a strong feeling that's gonna be the case. Okay, the next part we wanna talk about is extracting uh, information from backup data. Uh, a number of multifunction printers provide a method for doing backups or cloning operations. Uh, these functions uh, provide a, a method to quickly deploy multiple systems within an organization. As I mentioned earlier, if I have 100 printers to deploy, do you really want to go to 100 printers and configure them? No. You cut a clone or some kind of backup, you deploy that to the other printers. Uh, and and uh, Xerox has built in functionality specifically for doing that. In this case, we're going to look at a Canon and we're going to look at a Xerox. So the first one we're going to look at a Canon kind of an older one, it's the Image Runner 3030. Uh, they have several different things you can back up. They have address books, and we know there's data possibly in address books. 
uh, forwarding settings, additional functions. The additional functions are the ones that should contain uh, LDAP settings, uh, their core settings within the system. So if we click on that, we, we come over to additional functions, and these are all the, the, the capabilities that will be pulled on the additional functions. So if we click actual uh, export, it'll export a backup of the configuration. If you use this, be patient. It is very slow. It runs, oh gosh, takes 5, 10, 15 minutes based on how much configuration has been done on the device. It'll generate a file called usermod.umd. This is stored at the root of the URL. So if someone's run it in the past, you can forceful browse it and pull it off the system. Uh, and uh, the, this is not a ASCII file, it's actually a data file, so it cranes all kinds of stuff in it, but there's some ASCII string data in it. So if we explode that up, you can see in the string data, uh, the username and password are in plain text. Um, so in this particular device, you're able to pull uh, that core information out from a backup of the device. The next one we want to talk about is the Xerox. In the Xerox here, uh, obviously it's a cloning function. If you click on the cloning function, you can see all the features that are available there. And you basically click clone. And what it'll do is it'll create a file called cloning.dlm. Uh, the DLM is a, uh, let's see if we got a picture of it. Uh, we'll show it in a minute. Uh, that's also stored at the root of some devices, uh, some Xerox devices, and if it's been ran and run in the past, you can forceful browse and gain access to that file too. Some of the newer ones uh, also uh, put a timestamp in front of the cloning, so you can't do that. But still, if you get access, you can run your own cloning file, you can pull the information down. So let's go ahead and actually look at these cloning files, because this is important. got two examples to look at here. Um, so if we CAD a cloning file, uh, you can see that it's really no readable data uh, typically in the cloning file. Um, but there is some readable data in the header of the cloning file. Um, and it's the structured header that's been put on there by Xerox. Uh, I was doing some research and searching around and I found a Norwegian website where a couple of these tags showed up in the data on the site. I did, the site was all in Bork Bork, so I didn't know what the hell they were saying. <laughs> I found a good converter and converted it from Bork Bork. Uh, and it gave me some interesting information. It, ge it generally came out and said, and it happened to be a Xerox employee in that region of the country, and he said basically that this is a custom tarball, compressed tarball file with a custom header on it. So the theory is you rip the header off, you should be able to untar it. And easy enough, we're able to extract the data out of this file. Um, the cool thing is, is uh, they use the same cloning functions, um, if anyone's interested, in their um, actual firmware upgrades on some of their devices too. Uh, so you can get all the data in the firmware. So the cool file we're interested in here happens to be under the data segment. Uh, and it's a CFG clone. So you can see basically everything in these files is, is generally plain text. Um, let's go down, see if we can find some passwords. So you go to all the different settings and uh, most of them have no password set. They're not configured. Uh, here we got one for SMTP with a password of milk.5. Uh, we come down here and here's the LDAP completely set up with what's up and the password was milk.5. Um, this is your typical cloning files uh, uh, that are uh, 
devices that are out a, a couple years old, okay? They've actually done some uh, attempts to actually secure this, um, and, and I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, we haven't cracked it yet, but we were heavily working on figuring out what the mechanism that's being used here. So, but let's go ahead and go to example two so that we can show that. Very similar in structure, a lot of useful information. Uh, even if you don't get the passwords, you can see the LDAP password happens to be um, 32 character uh, hex, which, which makes us quickly think that it's possibly a hash. Uh, but the truth is, if this is a cloning function, remember this file has to be transferred to multiple devices. For that device to be able to authenticate to whatever the LDAP is, it's gonna to have to have the plain text to be able to do that. A hash is not reversible, so it can't typically be a hash. So we know it's some form of, of encrypted. Uh, not sure why. Um, the, the, the cool thing is, is, uh, is I do have all the programs that are used to trigger the cloning operation. So hopefully we can figure out what that is. And we also know a lot of these devices, the newer ones use Ingress databases uh, on the printers um, within the operating system to store all this data that's pulled out. So is it being encrypted inside the databases? Uh, so there's a lot of key things that we need to figure out yet. Uh, unfortunately, the, this printer that this came off of is like a $20,000 printer and, and no one's gonna lend me one. So, um, so it's a very short burst of, of knowledge that we gather uh, and it's constantly building on the big picture. And hopefully we will get to that point uh, where the, 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 the light goes on and we know exactly what's taking place here. At that point, we'll probably uh, release that information as part of our tool, Praeta. Uh, earlier this year, we le released a tool called Praeta. Uh, Praeta is Latin for uh, plunder, thief, robber. Uh, and that's what the tool does. Its whole goal is to plunder your printers for possible usable information. Uh, my team uses this on a regular basis. We're always constantly trying to improve it and make it better. Um, and it contains a printer module, so it looks for printers. It does check the default passwords for a couple network appliances. The ultimate goal is to incorporate also uh, various uh, network appliances also, because they, they suffer similar problems. Uh, I regularly find uh, network appliances with default passwords on them, uh, cameras and stuff like that, and a lot of those devices integrate with other systems. At a minimum, SNMP is a standard uh, integration, uh, one engagement gained access, SMP string was the same one that they were using on all their firewalls and, and Cisco routers. So we quickly gained access to all that stuff uh, because of a camera uh, that was configured with an SNMP. But uh, the tool is beta, or, or uh, I'll be honest with you, the tool is barely beta, okay? It's not really buggy, uh, it's written in Perl. Um, uh, I, I wrote the code, uh, the code is, in my opinion, I kept it very simplistic. There are some coding methods that I used or structure methods that I used to build this that may be a little strange to some people, um, but when I was researching how to modularize this whole thing, uh, I just felt comfortable going in this direction versus, you know, it's Perl. You can do the same thing 365 different ways. Um, and this just happened to be one of those 365 different ways of doing things. And the goal was to create a simplistic tool um, and generally the tool is made up of four general parts. You have uh, Pareto PL, which is the dispatcher. Uh, the way the dispatcher works is you feed it a target list of IPs of printer devices. And what it'll do is it'll crawl through those IP addresses, querying the title page and the server type. 
So we have a file called data file. In the data file, as you can see, we have a sequential list uh, numbering on the left-hand side. And then we have the next tag area is actually the title page. The next tag area is the server type. We find out that it's a fairly reliable fingerprinting method on these type of, or on most embedded systems because, you know, they want to tell you what their product is and what model number it is and all that type of stuff within that key information. And then the last part is actually the modules that have been written to do uh, information gathering and web page gathering and parsing and all that type of stuff. So, so the Pareta will, will use the target list, uh, it'll compare it to the data file, and if it gets a match, it'll run the modules. Uh, and that's simply how it works. So at present, I think there's, I could get this wrong because there's two different versions. There's a release version and an internal version, which isn't quite up, been released yet. But I think there's like 28 different variations of modules. Now, uh, when, I, when I put this thing together, because the fact that as an assessment engineer, I gain access to your Xerox, it may not see that model again for three, four, five months. Uh, and I may find the next engagement a model very similar, but the quarry method in the page may be slightly different. I ended up creating a different module. And the purpose of that was because there's no way to go back and retest the older system. So if I make changes to, to uh, incorporate multiple variations, I, my fear was I would step on myself and clobber myself. The goal is once we get this thing big enough and get a big enough test base from people playing around with it, we'll be able to collapse a large number of these into modules that, that you know, pulls the uh, address book and pulls this and pulls that from the printer and covers a half different um, variations of a Canon printer versus having four or five different uh, modules uh, to actually do the same thing, and that way we wouldn't step on ourselves. Uh, we're also looking at migrating over to Ruby. Um, we we got a couple base Ruby versions that have been written, but we haven't gone through and vetted them and tested them and all the variations and stuff. But the ultimate goal is, is if we can get this thing structured, working successfully on a large number of systems, uh, that it could eventually be incorporated in a Metasploit. Yeah. That, that would be the ultimate goal. Uh, we're also working on HP and Xerox encryption methods that they use to encrypt certain backup data files, as I showed earlier. Uh, and generally, uh, I work for FUFASnet, and we're actually hiring. So if anyone's interested in getting a job as a pen tester, we're looking for a developer. Doesn't have to know pen testing. We'll teach him to pen test, but we're looking for a developer. So if you're interested, shoot your resume to jobs at fufus.net. It'll be later this year. And uh, that's pretty much the presentation. Uh, do we have any questions? Oh, come on. Uh, no silence. That's no good. People playing with the tool. Play with the tool. Write modules. I mean, they're really, really simplistic uh, Perl modules. You know, just grab a web page and it parses data is generally what it's doing. Or if the device actually exports something, you just trigger that export and gather that data. So you can easily look at these modules and create new ones. Tell us what the printer is. Or if it generates error message or brings back garbage. You know, sometimes if, it, if, if an error condition we haven't seen before occurs, you may end up with, you know, a whole page of HTML when it should have just said in the log file, you know, a password or something like that. So those type of things would be good. Anyone has any 10, 15, 20, or $30,000 printers they want to give me, um, that would come in handy, uh, which is unlikely. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, in my opinion, I think Xerox is making an attempt. Um, since I started this project, uh, uh, I started it last year. I was actually, before SHMU, I did uh, an interview with MIT um, Tech Review. That was picked up by MSNBC. Since then, I've done two, two interviews with printer industry trade magazines. Um, so, so the goal is, is, you know, I want to get everyone doing it. Um, can I say one's better than the other? You know, if they have patches, are you installing them? That's the question. Because you know they are releasing patches. Toshiba contacted me after SHMU and said that they, were, they had a patch. Uh, they were supposed to follow up with a phone call, which they didn't, so I'm not sure there. They thanked me, which they probably shouldn't have. But um, So there's potentially a patch out there. 
uh, for that security bypass. Yeah. Oh, you're talking with the card access system on them? I have not had a chance to experience those. I see those are a lot of times being used in military government installations now on a, on a large scale. But unfortunately, I haven't done assessments which gave me access to those type of things. Uh, it may be fascinating, you know, what would the security implication be? I'm at the console on that device and I'm required to authenticate with a card, but if I can go in through the web interface and rip you a new asshole, what do we solve? Uh, it's pretty bad, and we've only talked. Uh, we've only uh, looked at the web interface so far. There's other resources or other interfaces on these printers. Uh, you know, they run an SSH and Telnet. Um, so, you, and these large systems, uh, Xerox and um, Canon large systems, are running actually a Sun OS on a Power PC. So it's a full-blown operating system. Yeah. There's several, several different things. Uh, one, do pay attention to patch management on the devices because um, most of the stuff I showed you with Canon doesn't work on all the devices. So my surmise is that there's a patch for it or a new version out there. Uh, the other thing is change default passwords or set a password and make it a real password. You know, something associated with a campus name just doesn't work as a password. Uh, the other thing is, is look at what the printer's being used for. When we're talking about the printer on the payroll system, why is that accessible by some schmo that just plugged into your network? Why isn't that isolated and only access to those type of resources? So if you do that, you set the password, do a pass management, and set the printer up for what it's going to be used for, um, I think you, you can actually secure yourself fairly well. Uh, that's to me that would be a real overkill. Um, um, I, I think that if I if I plant my butt on your network and I plug in, uh, there's probably about 300 other ways I can own you from left uh, versus using a printer. This is just one of many. Um, this is actually when we do this on engagement, it's what we do the last day. Usually the first day we have your domain admin accounts already. Um, I don't think there's a case that hasn't been the case. But uh, any other questions? Yeah, if you want to do like a Peros or a Burp uh, proxy capture of, of a transaction of usable data, clean the data, please. Yeah, don't, don't send me your passwords. And, and, and don't do that against somebody you, you legally do not have access to. I don't want that data either. Yeah, man. have to speak oh yeah he had asked the question earlier it was a similar question and and I had mentioned that Xerox in my opinion seems to have a focus in that area but but we still have to have the end users educated you know they can build all these features into a printer if they're never utilized by the end users what's the point if I can gain access and I can make mods to your to your printer or and you know if I can gain access like this what's the next step I can pretty much pull anything off the hard drives in some cases and, and all that stuff Xerox doing all kinds of cool things. They're doing full disk encryption and, and all kinds of crazy things. Um, so I think they're doing the right thing. They're moving in the right way. And I'm hoping the noise that I've created will get the other vendors uh, moving in the right direction. Yeah. How do you get people to let you test their printers? Uh, I'm actually, Not let us. right, I'm, I, I work as an assessment engineer at Pentest. So you know they, they pay me to come on their site and assess their security. So. You gotta be kidding me. Why would they say printers out of scope? Now you definitely don't want to run the, you don't want to run a scanner against a printer like a Nessa scanner. Oh that that does uh, you run Nessa scanner against this thing, it pukes all over itself and starts flashing. And and most of the printers will do that. So if you run Nessa scanner against printers, they're actually <laughs> gonna start spewing hundreds of pages in lockup. That's a guarantee. Uh, because you remember when you hit port ninety one hundred, port ninety one hundred just takes whatever hits it and prints it. So if Nessus just feeds it garbage, it's going to try to print it, and then it causes all kinds of crazy things. Yeah, but it's a denial service. Um, I, you know, yeah, 
there, there's a lot of open area here for bad things that can be done because you know what, a lot of devices, I'm, I'm not saying which ones and how many, but the actual uh, firmware upgrade, it, you can just send it to 9100 and it'll process it and do a firmware upgrade on certain devices. Yeah, because if you, if you, if you, look, if you look at a lot of the firmware upgrades, uh, they're actual, uh, all framed up in PCL. Uh, they're PCL jobs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. M most of them will just pretty much do that. Yeah, it's a, it's a potential attack vector. Uh, but the thing is, is I'm sure I will never convince anyone to let me test this on their twenty thousand dollar printer. <laughs> Nor would I try to. <laughs> One back here, yeah. You want to speak up? You know, uh, I have not yet. I did some experimenting on these devices uh, and some of the variations of the Office Jets and some of the other models. You could actually hit the device remotely across the internet and go to the configuration page and check the wireless. It'll actually pick up all the wireless in that area. So if you get past the device, you know, I've, I've always theorized if I can connect to a device somewhere close to me on someone's network, well, what's the potential of getting it to connect back to me while it's physically connected to the network? Is there any way to carry an attack there? And it, there's always a possibility. I know some of the printer companies will not allow the wireless and wired uh, ports to be up at the same time. And that's how they've tried to fix that. But not all of them do that. What was that again? You say that a little louder? No, I have not. The, the firmware, the firmware, I have not done yet. Uh, I haven't played around with any injection attacks like that. So far, we 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 have a lot of thing on the the big list of nasty things I want to do in life. Um, and uh, right now, we're just trying to get our way through all the web interface stuff. You know, it's like the whole everything's laid out to me and once once I get to the point where I have that under my belt and then oh yeah we're gonna move on to some other cool capabilities uh, all the way and I've said that and I've had brainstorming sessions with with people about uh, uh, attacks with uh, firmware upgrades that would actually load on these high-end systems all new code you know exploit code tunneling code scanning code that can be triggered through the web interface um, so we sat down and brainstormed and thought about that. So there's a lot of attack vectors associated with these printers, but uh, that I've not done yet. I think we're pretty much out of time. Let's give Daryl a hand. Wasn't that fantastic? <laughs>